Issues finding our office like I did yesterday. Um, I'm from the uh, Tempe office in Arizona. I want to thank Matt and Eric from uh, Stackpoint Cloud for inviting us to host and present to the Seattle Kubernetes. Kubernetes, I guess, uh, a term for if you're meddling around in Kubernetes. As developers, uh, we live in exciting times, and uh, Kubernetes and Docker have revolutionized the way that we uh, package and deploy applications. I'm sure most of you know. How do I know that? Because I put it on a t-shirt. Along with the other favorite things that I got, my kids, Connor and Renee, um, jQuery, that was another awesome leap in technology. Um, my name is Daniel Clayton. Um, I work on our PNC team uh, that focuses primarily on Go Central. I'm the build and release engineer, um, and I'm responsible for, uh, for uh, I own the CI CD system and all the Kubernetes infrastructure that we have. Primarily enabling continuous integration, continuous deployment for our engineers, allowing them to focus on, uh, focus on features and um, making the CI CD process simpler. And as a, as a developer, um, I, that's, that's a huge part. Um, going back in the day where uh, it would take um, 60 days maybe to set up an environment, um, you know, full on, full on day to deploy a change, uh, having CACD has certainly been quite helpful. I've been working with Kubernetes since it was back in the betas, not to be confused uh, with the betas of today. If you're, part of, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, um, you know that uh, beta is still around, lots of alpha, lots of beta. Be familiar with beta. Um, so uh, this is all about Go Central and our story of how we uh, progressed from uh, sort of a monolithic design, uh, long deployment processes, long spin up um, to Kubernetes and minute long deployments. Uh, Go Central is uh, an online website builder uh, that enables. Uh, marketing and um, e-commerce tools. The application was built mobile first, uh, meaning that all design decisions were all uh, uh, placed, placed in mobile experience first in priority. The primary applications were built using Node.js and React and are hosted on Kubernetes clusters around the world. So why did we pick Kubernetes? Here's some of the top advantages that we see. Uh, Kubernetes enables us to make changes to an application and see them in production isolated from application production traffic. It also enables us to spin up a set of applications used to test each other. Um, the ability to spin up applications very, very rapidly enables us to have lots and lots of isolated environments. Whether you're using Kubernetes running in a private cloud, Google a container engine, or a cluster in AWS, we can use the same manifest to deploy an application. That's huge. Another advantage of Kubernetes is that it enables us to update OS, and of course that's part of Docker, is enabling us to update uh, different components. Uh, say for example, Node.js, um, and you want to bump the version of Node.js, you don't have to worry about pulling servers and things like that, so you can have an isolated environment. Um, test them in production, and the cool thing is, is basically rolling back them as if they were code. Elasticity, um, so using built-in auto-scaling features of Kubernetes, and um, our applications can run lean, yet scale up when load increases beyond the acceptable threshold. And when applications crash, VMs go down, or general networking issues, 
Kubernetes automatically heals itself. But probably the biggest advantage of these is our ability to deploy quickly, increasing our velocity. And when you talk about CI CD, it's about being able to iterate quickly. And uh, Okay, so why do we need to move quickly? Well, online presence is becoming the dominating marketing and commerce platform with over 600 million active websites globally. Both Central is in a highly competitive space. And if we don't move quickly, someone else will. Like MySpace. <laughs> so let me get a little uh, trend of our velocity since 2011. This trend line describes the increase in our deployment velocity from 2011 to today. Um, I joined the team, the PNC team. I've been with GoDaddy for about 10 years, um, and uh, I've been with the PNC team for about five. Um, so about that time, we were working, we just did release V7, but some, some trend data. Uh, version six of our website builder product um, was hosted on a Microsoft stack. Um, we had a lot of manual testing, manual deployments, lots of stress, lots of uncertainty. At least half a day to deploy, probably a full day, to deploy a new application would take over two months, you know, uh, requesting new hardware, um, going through all your firewall requests, things like that. And it's, it's amazing because it's within the span of my youngest child. It's, it's, it's really a cool thing. In 2014, we knew still, we knew something was not right. Um, we redesigned the product from the ground up. The, this time we designed the application with test automation in mind, but we wanted to increase our, our certainty, our confidence. Uh, and we also leveraged um, agile methodology called Scrum, um, and that allowed us to focus on um, slicing our features up small so that we can um, iterate and get feedback from our customers quickly. Just last year, we moved, we decided to make massive changes. Now, V7 was a brand new product, and uh, a lot of all new code. Uh, we had, I mean, all our data structure was new. Um, we added some new things in there, Agile, <laughs> so we introduced to uh, test automation, um, got our confidence level up. Um, however, Go Central was uh, leaps and bounds above the changes we made for version 7. Um, so we moved from my, Microsoft to the Linux stack, which was uh, certainly a big change for us. Um, but that enabled us to use more open source technology like Kubernetes. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server to Cassandra. This enabled us to be more cost effective uh, for multi data, uh, data center uh, storage. On the browser side, we moved from grid layout to responsive with an initiative of mobile, mobile first. And my favorite um, being in the CI CD area is our new CI CD system and our Kubernetes clusters. I'd like to say that Kubernetes was the only key to this trend. However, there were significant cultural process changes. And um, with this trend this year, we, we are targeting um, uh, 7,000 Battery died. Well, great. Sorry, it's not. Technology, gotta love it. It's probably why Kubernetes has beta still in it. <laughs> it's, it needs help too. Um, so um, we, we actually had like in version six, we had uh, 26 deployments per year. Version seven, we move up to 368 up to 979 deployments per year. Uh, Go central um, in, in 2016 for the year, um, we had 3,000 over 3,000 and this year we're targeting 7,000. That's huge because um, when you talk about CI CD, that's the ability to um, iterate quickly and it's, it's not necessarily on the technology side, it's primarily about the business. And it's being able to put something in front of the customer, see the change, uh, let them see the change. They don't like it. They'll feedback and say, hey, we like this or that. And then we can respond quickly on that. And that was the big key. 
But um, so, like I said, uh, I'd like to say Kubernetes was was all to, to blame for this uh, this increase, but it really was about uh, really was about culture and process changes as well. Um, the big part is um, leveraging agility, and that is um, uh, being able to break our features up very small and um, mm -hmm. ship quickly learn and repeat and the other thing which is huge and this takes a, a, a lot more i think on the development side is is uh, a lot of automated testing and that's a, that's a lot of our workload is automated testing and if you want to learn more about how we went through this um, um come see me after the presentation and i can go over some of how we how we do that the heart of our deployments is our CI CD system. Um, who has heard of Travis CI? Cool. You know, I was at a presentation the other day and I said, who heard of Travis CI? And like two people raised their hand. I'm like, really? But I think they were all testers. <laughs> Most of these are engineers, I can tell. Um, our system is very similar. Um, a YAML file is dropped into a GitHub repo and that file drives how the application is packaged and deployed. When a repository is created in our private GitHub, Jenkins, using the CI-CD core, creates the pipelines and configures the post-receive hooks in the GitHub repository. When commits are pushed to the, to the master branch or pull requests are issued, Jenkins runs the pipelines which interact with the different services needed to package and deploy the application. Let's take a look at the YAML file. Okay, we chose YAML because YAML is a common language that most engineers know. Is, most people know YAML here. I mean, obviously, no Travis CI, you know YAML. Um, and, uh, and it's not tied to any particular build system like Jenkins. Um, some people are starting to move over to Jenkins Pipeline, um, which, which, uh, which is nice. Uh, I, like, I like that setup, um, but there are reasons why we didn't do that. So now I'm gonna put on my developer hat and I'm going to walk through um, what I, as a developer, would do to deploy an application through our CACD system into the Kubernetes clusters. All right, so I just built a Node.js application called MyApp that will be accessible over SSL at myapp.int.godaddy.com. When my application is deployed in the environment, I wanted to run two buckets of tests. I created a new branch in GitHub, then submitted a pull request to merge my app into master. A lot of people use that GitHub flow. You guys use that GitHub flow? Pretty common one. The CICD detects uh, the PR and kicks off a PR pipeline. The application is built, dependencies installed, then deployed into our development and test Kubernetes clusters. My tests are run in each environment. Build status is reported back to my pull request and Slack. Finally, for applications that require manual testing, a link is uh, a link to an isolated environment, and that's the huge thing about Kubernetes, is the ability to rapidly deploy and deploy quickly. You can spin up lots of isolated environments. Finally, the applications that require man manual testing, um, the, the test results are actually published to, um, to the pull request. Um, so my goal in building this the system and then interacting with different components is that it enables the developers to to have a single place that they know the status of their changes, um, rather than having to worry about going to Jenkins and then going to this service and then going to that service and figure it out. I want to centralize it all inside there. So this is kind of the flow. Um, they create a feature branch. Um, they submit a pull request. The system builds, deploys it into Kubernetes cluster, then we run a series of different, different sorts of tests, smoke tests, we do performance testing, things like that. And then um, we're getting this isolated environment. Now, we are fortunately a, a uh, uh, domain registrar um, as well as a certificate authority. So we get the benefit of, of issuing certs and, uh, and registering DNS. Um, but the benefit here is we have international testing a lot where we have you know, different locales and different things like that where um, we have someone across you know, in China or uh, other countries that need to do our testing for us. And so um, we spin up the environment and then you know, 12 hours later they can go and test it. Then they merge their change into, into master. It builds, follows the same process, but in this case it actually 
push us that build live in each one of the environments. Isn't this a Kubernetes talk? So I've been talking about it on process and things like that. I'm sorry. Um, get that out of the way. So this is how our Kubernetes clusters current, we currently have them. Um, we have clusters in all of our data centers. Um, we are working on a, a public cloud, um, like, like a, a Google uh, Container Engine and uh, clusters in AWS. Um, all of our in our private clusters are uh, are built on OpenStack and and uh, running on CentOS 7. We use uh, uh, GeoDNS for service discovery, and that what that does is allow some applications within each cluster to not only talk back to the services running in the same cluster, um, but uh, you know customer traffic coming into those clusters um, gets to the nearest cluster. Um, we have a separate staging cluster that acts as our dev and test environments and any other environments for, say, for example, we have Selenium grids in there. We use it for Jenkins slaves and other things that run into that cluster. So this is how we actually, this is the object structure that we use to deploy an application. Uh, so in the CICD YAML file, um, we have, um, we have, if you look down at the bottom, the uh, labor doesn't work. Um, we have a definition of the clusters we want to deploy to. The clusters are defined in a GitHub repository that is um, that's separate from the applications, um, but allows us to go and say we spin up a new cluster, say in Google uh, Container Engine, um, spin it up in there, we can define it in there, and the application engineers, if they're using a syntax similar to that, then their applications automatically get deployed to those clusters as well. Um, so uh, you guys are familiar with all the objects, uh, Replication controller, service, things like that. Okay, so the way we do it is we don't use a deployment object. Um, one deployment object even today still has beta on it. Um, so we, there's still some bugs in it. Uh, what we do is we actually use replication controllers. That's kind of the key. Replication controllers enable us to spin up many, many different versions of uh, different builds all at the same time and know that we can toggle to any one of those at any time. So. For every build, we create a replication controller, a service object, and an ingress object. Um, and of course, replication controller is going to spin up whatever pause it needs to as part of that. <coughs> Each application is given a, an ingress and a service object that represents the uh, customer traffic, or the default, if you want to call it the default build. And um, so that's pretty much the way it works. And every time a new build is uh, deployed into the environment, it's these objects are created, and a DNS entry that points directly to those individual builds is available to the, to the engineers. So if I, as a developer, I submit a pull request, uh, it will uh, build my app, uh, publish it to our factory, um, it'll uh, deploy it into our test environment, our, our uh, dev environment, and your pull request will see code coverage information, things like that. It'll also have uh, links to my environments. So, I can, so an engineer could actually submit their pull request, a few minutes later, they click the link on in their test environment and they can go and do manual testing, testing if they need to. So let's take a look at how we actually perform a rolling update. So we've deployed out version one, right? And now we've made a change to version two. So uh, with Kubernetes, we have labels um, on every object. And so what we do is a uh, service, most of you are familiar with services, it's basically like a, a filtering mechanism to, to point to whichever pod you want. So version, every replication controller um, gets labeled with the name of the app, um, whether it's live or not, and a version number. The service that's tied to that particular build points to uh, the name of the app and the version. And of course, the ingress points to the service. So when I want to go from version one to version two, all I need to do is go and update that live flag to, it's actually supposed to be true, I don't know why I said live, but it's supposed to be true. It, it'll actually be updated to true. And what, what happens is uh, we start off with a canary test. So I'm rolling out my changes in version two. It'll actually roll out one pod. That pod, Will actually be promoted to live. So you could have 100 pods plus one pod or two pods, depending on how they have it, have it configured. Then they run automated tests. You have also customer, uh, you have customer traffic that's hitting it. And we monitor 
the issues that are happening with this app, whether it's crashing um, or, uh, uh, or you know, there's, there's just errors and logs and things like that. If there's any issues, then we can actually roll that back and, and fail to build or fail this deployment. If it's uh, successful, then we continue on with the, with the upgrade um, from, and we basically scale, we scale up replicas on the V2 side, pretty much what like the deployment object does, and then starts decreasing the replicas on the uh, V1 side. We, I don't use the coop control command for anything because I like the raw control over how the, our deployment strategy is. So in the case of doing a rolling upgrade, um, one, we use replication controllers. So that the rolling update wouldn't work with, with that. But with this, um, we can ensure that a certain percentage of pods that we're doing a rolling upgrade remain in service for traffic. Um, also, we can ensure, we can allow some pods to fail and there's reasons with that. There are infrastructure problems and things like that, and you don't want to block a pipeline because of that. So as long as, and the nice thing is the, uh, is the uh, resiliency of Kubernetes and its ability to basically say, hey, this pod is down, and it keeps those pods out of service, that allows us to move forward with 80% uh, of pods um, deployed out. Um, these are other features that we have in our Kubernetes clusters. Um, we, we have the ability to restart pods and redeploy, um, deploy to all clusters in parallel. Um, when I build these pipelines, I want them to be super, super fast from a developer experience as well. Um, it also helps when you have to say roll back, you need to, maybe you need to roll out a hotfix real quick. You know, and so anything we could do to streamline this, um, the better. So uh, deploy out to all your data centers all at the same time, test them all at the same time, and, and do a rolling upgrade across all at the same time as quickly as possible. We also have um, dependency discovery, so each one of our clusters has, um, has uh, config maps, if you're familiar with config maps, and those maps are uh, it's automatically mounted into each build so that they can reference uh, uh, different resources, say um, I want to access this particular service, may not, exist in, uh, may not exist in this data center, may exist in another data center, um, and so I don't really want to Worry or how the developers have to worry about where where do I need to talk to? So um, we put those in there. Um, Result.com file. If you guys I don't know if you guys have seen the warnings in the later versions of Kubernetes, <laughs> too many search terms. Yeah. So um, the resolve the resolve com file is tweaked by Kubernetes and um, and it doesn't necessarily make for better DNS resolution. So look into that if uh, if you're seeing performance issues calling out to an outside service. DNS could take time to resolve. Um, we also, each one of our, on our private cloud, we actually um, host services on our individual nodes because we built them. Um, we put services like StatsD and um, like uh, log pushers and things. Um, and what that does is enables the applications, the containers that are mounted on those nodes to, um, to be able to um, uh, push information to StatsD without going over the networking performance issues that say an overlay network and other things have. Um, I've actually been experimenting with HA proxy. The most people use Nginx. Okay, so I found an HA proxy version, and I'll tell you, I did a performance test, and um, I, about two using Siege. You may be familiar with Siege, like Apache Bench. Um, I got 150 requests per second compared to 109 out of Nginx, and I've done prior load testing as well, and Nginx is definitely faster, um, and it seems to support a lot of the features that Nginx has. So um, might be worth looking out, doing a Google search on that. And it also gives you a stash, an HTML-based stats page, um, compared unless you buy the, the actual, the Nginx Plus version, you won't, you won't need that. Um, and then uh, something we're getting ready to add is auto-renewing our certificates on redeploys. Um, certificates expire, and so applications, app owners, um, all they need to do is redeploy their app, and it automatically go and reissue a new certificate and redeploy it. Lessons learned. Like I said, alpha and beta. Get used to it, there's a lot. Um, upgrade the latest flannel. Um, a lot of people use flannel. You guys use flannel for our local relay networking? Yeah. Um, so, so upgrade to the latest because I've run into problems in earlier versions. Um, the Docker overlay file system, um, the default, uh, the, uh, the overlay file system is faster. Um, but watch out for inode limits because it does use up a lot of inodes. Um, 
keep your images small. That's not really a Kubernetes thing, but but I tell you, keeping small images is is um, better on everything, on all your infrastructure. Um, an upgrade to etcd three changes the way that Kubernetes data is stored. Um, but watch out because um, uh, for as far as backups and things, you, you may still have to use 2.0 backups because of how you're using, how you're storing other data in there. Um, and then Prometheus, um, Prometheus is, is, is a great tool, um, but hosted in a Kubernetes cluster, um, it, it's not good, you know? It's, it's, uh, you need dedicated hardware for that. Um, I personally like Graphite, um, and I'd rather take, and I wish it was built into Kubernetes, take the data, export it to Graphite. Graphite's a better um, metric-based time series. Um, and so what we do is we actually have a service that um, pulls Heapster and pulls that data and pushes into Graphite. And so we're able to have our dashboard set up and our monitoring set up around that. Okay, so we, uh, as far as to do, um, we're still looking into auto scaling our uh, private cloud VMs, so our nodes. So I'd like to run lean. Um, and so that's something we're actually working on. Um, we, are, we are currently in proof of concept for leveraging public cloud. Um, I'd like to use some sort of network policy with uh, inside our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we do have network policies, physical network policies, but um, I'd like to have a little bit more within the Kubernetes cluster for isolating uh, different uh, business areas. Um, and then persistent volumes, we've used RBD, uh, Ceph um, volume, um, but that's like a single write, multi-read situation. So we as a company have really had a solution for that yet, but um, there's been so many needs for us to have, um, have that, so it's definitely something. Um, so the key takeaways, uh, Kubernetes helps deliver value, but not without CICD. Um, and so cultural changes, um, process changes are definitely part of that. Um, bucketed builds and canary releases. Um, I Deployment objects are great, but it's beta, there's still some bugs, and I think it's harder to enable you to spin up lots of lots of the same build and switch point between different things. And then uh, get used to alpha and beta. Thank you. Um, come back, talk to me. Um, if you want to know how we build our clusters, the tools we use, how we get them to run on Scent, uh, Scent 7. Um, and thank you. The next one, I'm not quite sure. Um, he was me. All right, well, we need just a transition minute to set up our next speaker. So if you want to grab a cupcake or a refreshing drink, please do so. Maybe five. Thank you. I've been for about 21 years and uh, uh, started in Python. Um, I kind of just run the gamut and then everything. So if you want to have a conversation about whatever, I'm probably your guy. So, uh, injection. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I won this shirt at Open West last week. I like it. Nice. <laughs> Um, so our technical leadership team, I'll just give you a quick background on that. Um, so uh, we've got Alex Canaris, who many of you probably know, he's pretty popular in the Seattle area. Uh, he was, he's the founder and CEO of our company. He was former CTO of AOL, uh, former CTO of Microsoft Online, uh, and uh, he was former technology advisor to Bill Gates, Bill G as they call. Uh, and then Chris Hanoka, uh, he is uh, king of engineering. Uh, VP of engineering. Uh, he formerly was the GM of cloud uh, infrastructure at Microsoft, which is uh, Azure, Azure, whichever way you want to say it. Uh, and he was the VP of engineering at, my, at, at Yahoo and also at ask.com. Uh, and then Archis Gore, who is right over there, so bombard him with all your questions. Uh, he's our CTO, and uh, he ran site reliability at Amazon uh, for uh, reliability and security to make sure Amazon was up and running so we can all have a wonderful prime day. Uh, so that's our team. Um, they are uh, some of the operators of the world's largest infrastructure. They know scale very well uh, and they know security very well. Also, just to let you know if there's any acronyms that I used or anything that, that might, you might be like, what is that? Just raise your hand, do one of these, and I'll define it. So I'm a developer. Everything needs to be defined. So. Um, <laughs> 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 so uh, traditional cybersecurity, uh, 
the, the thing about traditional cybersecurity is uh, the policies, you know, if you've worked with your security guys or if you, you, you know, or if you are a security guy, you're, or folk, you, uh, you want to lock everything down. And you really want to say, hey, look, nothing's getting through here. And that's the world of traditional cybersecurity. The problem with that is you have your business side of the house, your CEOs, your CIOs come in and say, hey, we want to move everything faster and more agile and cheaper and everything impossible that there is on the map. And they also want to be secure. And so how do you really do that when you have a massive firewall that's, block that's blocking everything? But then if you really want to get your, uh, you really want to get your code and your, your new features out and release to the public. Uh, and so that's kind of where Polyverse sits, is in a world, um, in a world of uh, understanding DevOps and kind of that, that sweet spot between security and DevOps, or excuse me, uh, uh, traditional security and DevOps. So, um, so today's world of security, number of, atta of attacks is increasing. Uh, the FBI, uh, the IC3, which is defined there, uh, the IC3 uh, uh, reported that they had $1.3 billion worth of uh, reported attacks, and that's reported attacks. There's plenty of people who can't report the attacks or don't know to report the attacks or, or hemorrhaging money, but they don't know that. And, uh, and so that's you know, something to keep in mind, that it's increasing. Now, one of the reasons why it's increasing uh, is because of the connected, device that are, connected devices that are slowly popping up on the, on the web, on the internet. Um, your somewhat connected devices, like your wearables, those types of things, those all are running software that can be taken over and used maliciously against anyone, against anything. And so the old days of, all right, let me go get, uh, let me you know, write a worm and take over 50,000 machines. Now, you know, I have six or seven devices in my backpack, right? And so, you know, one person times six versus the, you know, 50,000 times six is a lot. Uh, so uh, that's something to keep in mind. Now, I'm talking about attacks and vulnerabilities, but what is an attack? Um, an attack is, you know, any number of these things on here, data is modified, stolen, or held ransom. Uh, the most recent attacks have been, you know, things that are being held ransom. I heard a new term, I think it was erasedware, where, you know, I think there was a bug in uh, the ransomware, or they just didn't test their code, they tested in production. And so all the ransom that they had, people couldn't pay them, and things just got erased. And so that was, you know, their fault. But, uh, <laughs> um, unauthorized access, digital or physical. Um, you know, a lot of people forget about, let me just walk up to a computer and plug in uh, a USB drive and infect what I want to infect and walk away. Physical and digital are both very uh, important. Um, systems that are adversely affected, things uh, like Stuxnet, which affected the Iranian nuclear facility. Um, those types of, of attacks, you know, you might not notice them, but then all of a sudden something is going wrong, or it seems like something is going wrong. Um, you know, airlines say our, our computers are down. It's hard to believe that we're a billion dollar company that is down. Uh, so uh, resources that are used by un unauthorized parties. Uh, one of our clients actually uh, said that they, they discovered that someone was running a Bitcoin mining operation on their, uh, on their servers for a year. And, uh, and they discovered it was some 17 year old kid from somewhere in, uh, the, in Eastern Europe and he just made a lot of money just sitting on one of their vulnerable machines. So these are attacks to keep in mind. Um, like I said, I like to define things. So uh, vulnerability, uh, sorry, this is kind of small, I just stack a couple things on here. Uh, vulnerability, you've got things like human oversight, where people will, um, I remember my first hack was you know, returning a library book when I didn't return it, because the librarian left a password on, on a post-it note, and I said, okay, that's, that's how I'm gonna return my book after 300 days. And uh, so human oversight, people put passwords in, in file. They, put, they forget to change their password. They put you know, their password ABC123. That's the first step. Um, syntactical and logical bugs and code. Uh, developer just had too much caffeine or hasn't slept in 64 hours and forgot to put a check somewhere. Uh, and buffer overflow. Uh, we'll dive deeper into that uh, later on. Uh, so the next thing to note is the difference between an exploit and attack versus a vulnerability. A vulnerability is something that lies in every system. And it's, and that vulnerability will always be there. They never go away. Everything has a vulnerability. But to exploit or attack that vulnerability, or you use things like script injections, which is what's on my shirt here, which gives you full access to a database, and you can start adding users or doing whatever you want to do. Most people accidentally delete the database, but that's okay. Um, we're not okay, but whatever. So uh, jump-oriented programming attack, return-oriented programming attack, these are things that use your code against you or use your file system against you. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see a return on your programming attack uh, shortly. And then uh, virus and worm. Um, virus and worm is very similar, uh, and you, know, you can look those up, but that's usually something that makes its way and can learn and, and build on itself. So 
Now, zero day, um, we'll talk more about that as well. Zero day, you can think of patient zero, you can think of you know, ground zero, where things start. Um, zero day means that it's a vulnerability that has been discovered, just go to zero day vulnerability or exploit. It's a vulnerability that has been discovered that has not been previously known. Um, there are tons of these flying around. You can go on the dark web and find these things, the dark web. Uh, not that dark, really, but um, go on the dark web and find these things out there. They, a lot of them, you know, if they're really, really, really good, and are really, really, really powerful, um, they're for sale, and people will find these things. Um, that's why you hear bug bounties kind of offered by you know, all these major companies because they're trying to outpay the person who found it, and that's it. So, it's worth noting that our government spends five billion dollars a year on those. So apparently, our government still spends five billion dollars a year on those. Is that from paying people to find them, or no, no, they're they're buying them on the black market, oh. and then we're not the only exclusive buyer, <laughs> which helps add to your presentation of data security. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the next one is advanced persistent threat, which we'll also cover. Uh, and advanced persistent threats basically are just um, they're persistent threats that build on each other, or build on one another, and make their way through a system. And so, um, like I said, if there's any crazy questions or anything that I'm just skipping over and you're like that's terrible, just let me know. Do it anyway. Fuzzing. <laughs> you're missing fuzzing on this one. Fuzzing. Fuzzing. Blur the data and see if something happens, uh, like you've had things. Like there's, there's I haven't heard that term. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> all right, so the anatomy of an attack. Um, the Hollywood style attack is a myth. Um, <laughs> you've, all, you've all seen this, this interesting, you know, get me in there, drop Neo in. Um, it, it's a myth. Uh, there are ways to get into or to, to break something quickly with one line of code like this or something quick, but that generally doesn't get you what you need and they're generally blocked nowadays. Um, Facebook had one of these back in 2005. That was fun. Um, but uh, number two, realistic attacks are time consuming, they're multi staged and then they leverage a variety of attack vectors. But attack vector, if you think about it, is where you can attack someone. Um, you know, you have, let's think about a building, and I like to kind of uh, relate software to uh, the real world. Think about a building. If you have one door, then you have a very small number of attack vectors. Uh, that door has multiple attack vectors, but that is one door versus 17 doors with no cameras and no alarms, and that just makes things a lot harder. Um, and so think about that in terms of uh, software. You have a machine or you have a server that has 17 ports open versus one port that has all these different things that are not being watched and has no firewall. So that's, you know, relate things to, to the real world and it will get a lot easier to understand security. So continuing the anatomy of an attack, what typically happens is <clears throat> um, you, 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 you find a system and you want to know what it is. You, you see, it's a, it's a black box at the time. And so what you do is you do simple things. You know, you fingerprint it. You go to a wrong, <clears throat> a wrong directory on the web server, for example, and it says, oh, Apache version, whatever, running on Linux, whatever. Um, you know, several tricks like that are to mislead the, the attacker and say, hey, look, you know, this is running on Windows, but it's really running on BSD, right? And so, um, but that's a simple way of obfuscation. Another, the next step is to identify the application stack. Um, and then after that, you start looking at, so the application stack, just a quick touch on that, um, you could be running a LAMP stack, so Linux, Apache, MySQL, or Mongo, and PHP, um, that's a stack. And so you know now they've got these programs running on this operating system. So now you can go to number two, identify some vulnerabilities. You can look at, um, you can go search uh, common vulnerability databases, you can go on the dark web and join the US government and find some stuff in there. Um, and there's a lot out there, free and paid. Um, and then the third thing is to replicate the environment for test attacks. Um, and that's actually how I started coding when I was nine, is I was brought into a group and they were like, hey, we need to, we don't want to go breaking things, we actually just want to do war games and have fun. And so I was a replication guy. I'd look at a, at a site or a server or a system or whatever it was and start building whatever, the, to the best of my knowledge, exactly what that system had. Back then it was pretty easy, now it's hard to really see those things. but. Um, but that's what you go and do. You practice, you practice on that, you practice away. And the reason why, again, I'll get, we'll get on that later, is because most systems are homogenous nowadays and, and in the past. Um, and that means that, uh, that if you can build something that is exactly the same, you find a hole in that, then the hole exists on every other system that's just like that. And that's something that Polyverse is, uh, to, at our core, we make sure uh, is, is, is as hard as possible for an attacker to do. And I'll touch on that later. Um, what I want to get to next is uh, buffer overflows, uh, because as we move forward, we, we have something called a binary scrambler, which, which uh, all but prevents this uh, from happening, uh, and so it makes it extremely hard, and I'll touch on that. So quick example of a buffer overflow. <clears throat> you see this 
this, you know, you imagine you have a, a form on a website or in a, or in a uh, an application or whatever it may be. Um, you've got uh, eight spots for for uh, name to be, right? And so what happens if you enter nine characters? The program shouldn't allow it. Um, but even if you're the best programmer in the world, and you've you know blocked all your stuff. The underlying platform, the, let's say you're getting LAMP stack on PHP or whatever's running, that might have vulnerabilities in it. And so it might not be your fault at all, but there might be a vulnerability in that. And again, I'll show you how Java has that in a, in a few slides, um, an older version of Java. Um, and so eight characters were inserted, cool. But then we inserted a longer name, 10 characters, and you end up having uh, an overflow right here, which is something that is bad. <laughs> and so um, any questions on how buffer overflow, simple buffer overflow works? All right. Um, so what happens now? An attacker can insert instructions uh, here. And um, that's a small spot to insert instructions. Things are usually longer. <clears throat> but one of those instructions are things like the return-oriented programming, programming attack. Um, again, there's another one coming up, which I'll show you in the next slide um, on how you do that. So the instructions um, that you can put in there will point to memory, known memory locations because you have practice and practice and practice on a replica system, and now you know where to point that. And so since you practice on that replica system and you know where to point it, you can now take over the system. And that's how you, that's why people write viruses and worms to automate this just to go do it for them. And again, that's what we call break once and run everywhere. Um, so what does it mean for the attacker? They can get, uh, they can run privileged commands and those oftentimes lead to privileged access. Um, now, if you're, in a, if you're in a very, you know, insecure system or unsecured system, you can get something like the old matrix thing, it has one big script that runs all these different things and boom, does something, right? But that's very, very atypical. So, this right here is a uh, real zero day that was written by one of our engineers at Polyverse. And uh, it's, this is an example of, of someone crafting it using the victim as uh, the virus code. Um, so for this traditional uh, uh, antivirus, traditional firewalls, everything's gonna be passed or bypassed uh, because you're using the uh, J JVM, this is a zero day in a JVM that um, the system looks at and says, oh, everything's fine. Um, probably that fire gift where everything's fine, but it's not. And so um, this right here, what you see is the buffer overflow, or it's overflowing the buffer with this long string right here. And then it's finding out, it's using something called a ROP gadget, um, a, a return oriented programming gadget that um, will do the work of jumping you to where you need to be. This right here is bin dash um, for a Linux system, so it's a Java on a Linux system. This is bin dash here, and this is the command that you need to run, and that will give you a shell on, this, on the system. And so if you guys want to see him do that in three minutes, uh, we have a video of that as well. And so um, now something like this, you won't, uh, something like this, you, 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 know, you have to get actual access to the system and be on the system, but if you're some, someone running on a shared host somewhere, um, a, shared, you know, a shared host that you know, has other tenants on it, um, but or not just tenants, you know, back you know, when I had my first GoDaddy account, it was me and, 30 other websites on there. And if you could get admin access, you could do whatever you wanted to those websites. So um, a lot of times it's mitigated nowadays, but it still exists. So why is this possible? It's possible because you have kids like me when I was 16, it's a real picture. Uh, when I was 16, building you know makeshift machines that get out of the dumpster and replicating full websites and bank websites. And they have all the time in the world because I did a summer break. And you know, you, you find this and then you call the bank and then the people there don't believe you. And then, you know, if, if you're if you're a bad person, you go to the web and say, hey, you know what, I'm angry. But for me, I just kept sending emails and then eventually got you know free concert tickets out of it. So um, <laughs> but a static homogenous system is easy to hack. It's very easy. It's very simple, not simple, it's very easy to or simple to replicate. Um, and or it, it, you know, it's either if it's not simple, you take the time to do it because the value is there. You know that if you replicate one system, you're gonna get access to hundreds of thousands. Uh, and so uh, traditional defenses for this are insufficient, like I said. Firewall, antivirus, log, log analytics, and auditing and patching. You notice I have uh, three of these starred. The reason why I have them starred is because they are, uh, they are defenses after the fact. A couple of them will catch, hey, someone's trying to do something, but generally, you look at this and, and you look at your logs, and you're just like, oh boy, someone transferred 50 million to something else and I don't know where it went, right? And that's after the fact, that's too late. Um, I, I met with a, uh, a hosting company out of Utah and uh, they, they pride themselves on hosting WordPress and they do a really good job of it. So I asked them what the security story was. I said, hey, you guys must have a lot of security issues. And they said, yeah, yeah, we do. And 
in the case of what do you do? How do you, you know, a, a zero day pops up and all of a sudden uh, everyone's going haywire. What do you do? And they say, well, we wait until we figure out, until WordPress comes out with a patch. And that means that people are getting hacked constantly and stuff's just going haywire constantly. And that means that they have to sit back and wait. They can't do anything. And so, um, uh, also, the other big thing is um, attacks that can do get through are zero days and main craft attacks. That means that someone's sitting there, just like the zero day I just showed you, someone's sitting there and and they know exactly how the system works. They have an intimate knowledge of the system, and they are manually going in there, crafting something that works, and then once it works, they're good to go. So how can we stay safe? Something we call moving target defense. And uh, what this does is it creates dynamic <laughs> diversity. Uh, it foils zero-day exploits, and it foils advanced persistent threats. Um, again, I'll get more into how it foils it, but that's, that's what moving target defense is all about. You standing still means that you're easier, you're an easier target to hit. That's just, you know, common knowledge with, you know, duck hunting, whatever, right? So, um, uh, you know, creating diversity in your systems, that's going to make you very, very, very protectable. And so uh, people might show up and they say, hey, well, this door was here. They turn around and the door is now moved to another place. Um, and so uh, that's something to keep in mind. So do we have any Seahawks fans here? Anybody? Oh, a lot. It's great. Okay. So, do you know why the Seahawks learned about moving target defense? Anybody? Seahawks defense. It's what? Yeah. Close. But it's because they lost the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, <laughs> this great play, the greatest play in football history, Russell Wilson thought that someone was going to stand still and they didn't. And because of that, his exploit of their defense didn't work. So that's moving target defense and action. Sorry, I haven't used it. <laughs> so, is what? You changed a lot. We can leave it up for a little bit now. <laughs> so, um, advanced persistent threats, uh, they live on systems for an average of 30 plus days. The reason why is because people, you know, that industry average, people do not restart, reconfigure, uh, reformat their systems, but you put, they do not reformat their systems uh, uh, for an average of 230 days. So can you imagine not restarting your machine for 230 days? I, I don't think my machine would work. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons why I, I you know, I, I was convinced to, to come to Polyverse, you know, from the, first, the first days that I joined, um, back in college, every day, every morning, I would walk to class and I would set my machines. I had three machines in my dorm room, um, and I would set my machines to to reformat completely. Everything would just be wiped. And by the time I got to um, my class, sit down with my laptop, which was a, a really old Acer, whatever it was, compact, an Acer compact, and uh, I'd open it up. It took forever to boot up. I SSH in, and my machine was ready to go, completely wiped. And then I just ran a script. And it set everything back up, and we were good to go again. Because I was running a service that had, you know, 20,000 people, and I knew I was getting hacked. And in Polyverse, we we believe that, you know, you can't just say well, I'm not getting hacked. I'm secure. You have to take the approach of we know, or I know that I'm getting hacked. I know that that um, I will be hacked, and I know that that the hacks are are happening. Um, people are taking advantage of my vulnerabilities. And so, um, what if you could actually? reset your system regularly on a regular basis without your, your users taking any downtime, any downtime excuse me. Um, furthermore, what if your, what if your binaries uh, across, the, across the different systems uh, were unique? Again, like I said, that ROP attack that you saw was in the JVM that was downloaded from Oracle. That's directly from Oracle that everyone else is downloading. Same for PHP, same for you know, Node.js, anything that you have out there. Um, uh, Arches likes to quote the System D uh, uh, vulnerability that was out there for two years until, you know, two years there's a zero day in System D, which means that you are getting hacked. There's just no way around it. Um, system D is what uh, runs core of Linux, uh, one of the pieces of core of Linux. Um, so again, you saw, like I said earlier, break, run, break once, uh, run everywhere. Um, what if it was break once, run once? That means that someone would have to say, all right, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hack 16-year-old Kylie in his, you know, in his dungeon downstairs. They're not going to get anything out of me. It's going to be bad. So they have to focus all their attention on the most valuable, uh, the most valuable and most vulnerable person or uh, attack or uh, system out there. And sorry, and uh, and so 
most of, most of the times there's going to be someone more valuable um, than you know you sitting at home. So um, now take that and and look at the Internet of Things and connected devices. Now you know there's no more. Hey, I'm going to break one connected device and be able to get into all the Amazon Echoes. Uh, I'm going to. They're going to have to attack each and individual Amazon Echo, and so they're no, there's no longer going to be things like Stuxnet and those type of things that are attacking. Um, so uh, that brings me to the Polyverse application toolkit. And so what we did at Polyverse was build uh, a, a series of tools that do uh, binary scrambling, rapid cycling, and an application firewall. And they uh, focus on different attack vectors, different types of attacks, uh, and, and forwarding those. Um, so to get into it, just to jump right into it, compiler-based compiler binary scrambling. Um, if you imagine downloading any of these things over here, uh, you've got all the popular uh, binaries here that uh, that you use to build a system. Like I said, LAMP stack's here, Java's here, um, uh, Ruby's here. Uh, and what at, at, at Polyverse, what we've done is uh, we've, we've been able to build a custom compiler because of uh, the knowledge on our team. Uh, the custom compiler has uh, scrambled 10,000 plus packages in uh, CentOS, Alpine, and Ubuntu Linux. And that means that you uh, can point your repository with that one line of code down there and grab a polyverse uh, version of whatever, of Java, of curl, or of anything that you're running on your system out of 10,000 packages and run that on your system. At that point, the, the, the probability of uh, someone finding a, so let's, let's take, for example, someone downloaded uh, PHP uh, 6.3, right? So PHP 6.3, they download, and they, they start hammering away at it. They find, it. they find an issue with it. They find a vulnerability. They find out how to exploit that vulnerability. Then they go to you and they say, oh, you're running PHP 6.3. Cool. What they don't know is that you're running the Polyverse version of PHP 6.3. Um, if you're running their version of PHP 6.3 and got it from the same place, their, their attack is going to work. If you're running the Polyverse version, it's not going to work. The reason why is because we move things around. We move, uh, and, and uh, I'm going to put this in, a, in an easy way first, and I'll talk about the, the memory. But if uh, in math, A plus B plus C equals D, right? So that, but it's still C plus B plus A still equals D. And so if you're able to do that with the underlying machine code, then that means that the places that the memory, that the registers are going to be, the places that memory addresses are going to be, things that the places that, that where functions live are going to change. And so when someone expects a function, they make a, a jump attack, or they do a ROP attack or a jump attack, and it lands somewhere, and they expect it to do a certain thing, it's just going to explode. And the entire program is going to crash, uh, in a bad crash. Um, and so that's what this binary scrambler does. Um, right now, it's, it's um, the first of its kind, the only of its kind. And it works if your, your code is uh, semantically uh, the same as, uh, as it was before. Again, like I said, just the underlying machine codes change. Um, the memory registers and the, the places that, that it functions that are changed. Um, uh, and so, uh, any any questions on that before I move forward? How's it different from ASLR? Um, Archis, you want to? <laughs> we can ask Archis later because he he and uh, these two over here are, are the kind of core architects of that. So um, I can give you my higher level, but. <laughs> so should I be pondering this if I'm going to Kubernetes? Uh, yeah. So so we'll get to that. Um, it, it's actually underneath Kubernetes, and, and what you're running in your in your containers will be this right here. So, um, perfect for the next slide. That's rapid cycling. <laughs> and so, um, rapid cycling. And, and if you didn't get the question, he asked, uh, should he should he be pondering this if he's going Kubernetes? Um, and I have about four minutes left, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, so, rapid cycling. What we do is we look at containers and we say, hey, look, you know, it goes back to what I said I used to do every morning in, in, in college was restart or reformat my machine, restart everything. The big, the, 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 the point here is that your application should be something that could be easily and more gracefully turned on and shut, shut down. Um, if you have an application that's this monolithic thing and you're just like, oh God, if I shut this down, everything's gonna die, then that's kind of a problem, an architectural problem. Um, and we talked to our clients about that as well. So uh, what we kind of uh, suggest is looking at the 12 factor uh, manifesto they have out there on the web. And that talks about uh, kind of making your application more friendly to the morality. And so you want to be able to uh, make your application so that you don't care if it's getting turned off and on. You want to make sure that it's kind of stateless 
and then it just does its one job and it can be done. The rapid cycling, what happens is uh, we, re we constantly reset everything to a known good state. Uh, the, that known good state uh, could be, you know, every five seconds or every 60 seconds or every, as long as it's more, or faster than every 230 days, you're way ahead of the curve. So that's, the, that's, that's what we just need you to do. Um, and so again, down here, there's some overriding down that's going on, but um, the Docker run and an Oliver cycler immediately, um, that, that'll cycle your, or cycle your containers. You can pass it all the same, or the same flags and parameters that you would anything else. Uh, and so we kind of get out of your, out of your way. Um, and our developers, our CTO, they're all about getting out of people's way and just letting them code, and they don't like any extraneous stuff. So um, I'll keep moving at two minutes. And um, the Polyverse application firewall, again, this is something that um, makes use of the cycler and the scrambler. Uh, but it's, it's made to wrap around your, your container. It's made to be a, um, rather than having your edge firewall over here, which we still recommend to have, um, you know, more security the better, you can now secure your, your actual uh, container, your actual um, microservice, so that the developer who's writing the microservice can say, hey, I'm going to write this configuration that I know, I know how my, my code works. I only want to talk to this container. I only want to talk to this network. I only want to talk to these things. And that way, you're not talking, you're not having your entire um, developer and your operations team argue back and forth about what ports should be open, who should be doing what, and, and five years of, of back and forth before something gets done. Um, again, one line of code, um, thank those guys, thank one line of code, and uh, everything works you know, perfectly and magically. Again, passing all your flags and your, your parameters to it. Um, so case study, uh, we have one customer, uh, we have one of our customers, uh, has uh, about half a million lines of code, uh, 70 developers. It's a, a real-time application that uh, has a lot of moving parts, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, pieces of, of uh, software in the stack. And it and it only takes 20, 23 lines of code, which you can kind of see here, but it's obviously um, made difficult to see so that we don't uh, share their code and, and their uh, secret stuff. Um, but we implemented container cycling, binary scrambling, and session isolation. This is another uh, sweet piece of secret sauce that we have that makes it so that your sessions are not lost. You don't want to turn something off and your sessions are, are lost. Um, and so actually, let me go back one thing here that might be of confusion. When we cycle containers, um, what happens is we bring, you know, let's, let's say we start from the beginning. We bring your containers up. Your first set of containers, let's say you have three containers that are behind a load balancer, right? And, um, and anything that's behind a load balancer, that's something that we can call the um, So behind load balancer, let's say you have three um, containers that are, are being load balanced and serving your website. Uh, if you want to cycle those every five seconds, then we automatically have another set that's ready to go. And so the next five seconds, when, when five seconds go, happens, um, we, we, we move one over and then we bring another set in. And we wait until your sessions here are done before actually killing off those containers. Um, and so, uh, that's, uh, if you guys have more questions, let me know. So proof in the, uh, proofs in the pudding. Uh, so Polyverse, uh, we did a calculation and um, uh, the, the, the common vulnerabilities and exploits that are out there uh, from this past year, we would have stopped 89% uh, of those uh, if you were Polyverse. And uh, yes. What does this do to the stability of the binary release? Uh, the stability of the binary is, is the same, it's, it's, it's intact. Uh, it's my, my security guy who I just messaged a couple images. It's very critical. Yes, everyone thinks it's magic. And no, 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 no. <laughs> he, he works for Raytheon. Yeah. Crazy stuff. And he has a lot of experience with a similar type of system. And it always he, he considers this a risk and and, and this concern about yeah. using it. Yeah. So like, have you come across any security departments? seeing this as a risk for the stability of their product? Uh, no, and actually, uh, they, well, we, we have people that have concerns, but then what we do is we give them a, a field, we give them access to test it out for 30 days. And they can test it out, beat up on it, do whatever they want. And when really when they come back, it's, it's literally, it's the same binary that, that except the machine code, the underlying layers. Well, no, you wouldn't so, get the same MD5. Some right, you wouldn't get the same MD5, <laughs> right. But that's, but that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, you wouldn't. It just doesn't. You wouldn't. Right, right, uh, right. But so, how, how if you like, if I try to stack your stuff, looking for a problem, this is going to. 
let's 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 talk about this afterwards. And all right, I gotta right. take I wanna take him. Yeah. Yep. And so in an interpreted language, uh, your actual uh, your binary is going to be uh, one of one of these characters, right? And so you Python, I don't know Python, okay. But it's gonna be one of oh, there it is, right? Uh, but it's gonna be one of those characters, um, you know, and that's gonna be scrambled. And so your code remains the same, just like these people here. Uh, these people here, their code stayed the same. They had made no changes to the actual, the, the higher level code. You're, it goes through a scrambled binary and that's what's being attacked. Now if you have, uh, let's say you have you know, issues with your actual code, your application level code, then that's where you use that microservice firewall to make sure, to, to kind of secure things even more, lock things down even more. Um, so that's where you're gonna you know, target your, your injection attacks and, uh, and any of the higher level attacks that might happen. Um, that's what the application firewall is for. So, um, and then the cycling, you know, as we as we have said before, there, you know, things are multi-staged, and so you want to have um, uh, the the binary the binary is scrambled. But if they get past that, then they then have they have let's say five seconds, ten seconds to before they take down again, and then the binary is scrambled again. It's a different binary, and they, they don't know that, and so and then on top of that, you have the application firewall. So that's kind of does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. Uh, a compiled way of a compiled way of So. Don't do that. Um, I mean, I think you would use. Um, I think you would use the. Uh, I mean, I've seen the others for. I haven't written Python since I was I don't know, maybe 25 years or not 25, uh, 15 years. But uh, but in PHP, I know you could. There were some tools that do that. Those are open source, and if you run them through our compiler, then you can. You know, any open source code that, that that's like that, that can then be scrambled. And so, but we don't do that ourselves. We don't put output. Yeah, there was enough demand, maybe. But <laughs> so um, I want to answer your question. It's a longer conversation, but <laughs> so I, I want to finish this. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. Long conversations. <laughs> Walks on the beach. Wonderful. Uh, and so what I wanted to say here, um, there's Verizon breach, breach reports that were out. Um, you know, there was an 89 percent uh, number that I, that I put out there, but we've been, we've had extensive military validation. Um, you know, there's certain topics that we can't talk about, but um, that's been something that, that we've been tested and tested and retested. Um, you know, and at some point, sometimes we've had to even open up and make things easier for people and they still fail. And so the, the um, response, our response to uh, advanced persistent attacks and multi-stage attacks is to, you know, is, is to make it as hard as possible. Actually, in the, in the, the number uh, that Arch just calculated was uh, the probability is 8 times 10 to the negative 15. Um, that's the probability that someone can get into the system. Uh, ten to the power seventeen. Yeah, ten to the power. Sorry, so yeah, correct it. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, um, and so, yeah, and, and and that's 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 just nearly impossible. I would say improbable um, for someone to get through that. If they do, they're getting kicked out in five seconds, and then past that, if they have their configurable uh, firewall. Yeah. Yes, Right. Um, there's so many apps, you've got new releases, so how long does it take to inform, you know, the next version of Python? So, so let me just uh, rephrase so, so I can understand it. You're asking if uh, a new version of Java comes out, how long until we get it? Yeah. Uh, it's, we've got a massive server farm going, just grabbing that. So. Oh, is it automated? Yeah, yeah, it's automated, yeah. Yeah, either that or Arch is there at night you click. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's, this is, um, 
So we've actually had some papers written about us recently. Uh, and you go to our website, you can see that um, we've got some very critical people that, you know, we, we're, we're all about let's get, you know, as much critique as possible because it's security and these things matter. Um, we're protecting some really large systems, and that's what we um, kind of aim for. So uh, that being said, you can shoot me an email at kylie at polyverse.io. Um, feel free to ask me questions and, you know, pop up. Uh, I, if you have more, even lower level questions, those guys over there, very smart people. Um, I can answer a lot of your questions, so uh, feel free to come to me. If I can, I'll point you over there. So, uh, any other questions? Before I go stuff my face with pizza and beer, and beer, it's good beer. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming out again tonight. It's such a nice night. We have a little more lightning demo that we'd like to set up. So we have a little more time to say it's. Yeah. Like, we, the one thing that you didn't cite that would probably be like,